Today, Dr. Gan will present Psychotherapy and American Indian Healing, Pursuing Cultural co Compatibility. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gan in Sioux Falls and in the Kirka Summit. Thank you. It is a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you for having me, and I've been excited, looking forward to having a chance to share some ideas with you uh, since uh, learning about this really impressive and important conference. Um, we do have a number of things I want to try and guide you through, so I'm going to uh, try and move us right along here. I'm told if I push this, it changes the slide. Voila. Um, I should start by introducing myself. Uh, who am I? I am an American Indian a psychologist, an academic psychologist in particular. I am clinically trained, but I don't practice clinical psychotherapy uh, for reasons that you'll probably learn more about in the talk today. Um, but I remain engaged with American Indian communities in particular. And when you do that, of course, you have to attend to issues of culture, cultural practice, cultural process. And so I definitely try to do that in the work that I undertake. My research interests lie in culture and mental health, that intersection. I am really attentive to indigenous psychology. Uh, which we can unpack in some ways to try and understand in more detail, and especially in cross-cultural interventions. How is it that you help people who are going through tough times in Indian country in ways that don't necessarily draw upon the stock psychotherapies that we have available in our usual clinics? I have a few goals in this presentation. There are really four things I'm hoping we can accomplish today. The first is to consider mental health in American Indian uh, communities. The second is to consider the case for integrating counseling and traditional healing for American Indians. The third is to try and complicate the project to do that integration, so to appreciate better what's at stake and what the challenges are in attempting that. And finally, to impress upon you, I think, what I hope is uh, an interest in cultivating indigenous therapies for implementation evaluation as mental health services. Give you a little bit of a sense for what that might look like. So let's start today with the American Indian mental health context. It's hard to find pictures on the internet of Indians smiling. So this just happens to be Sherman Alexie, who I think is a fantastic author. But it wasn't because it was Sherman. It was just because it was someone uh, smiling. As I, this audience well knows, American Indians and Alaska Natives are the descendants of indigenous peoples. There's terrific diversity among our communities. We've had this amazing demographic rebound from, of course, five plus million in the continental United States at the time Columbus arrived, then way, way, way down by 1890 uh, and, to, and 1900, and then back up again. Um, 565 federally recognized tribes. Um, one of the dilemmas we have, of course, for health research is how to uh, designate who is American Indian. So many health researchers use survey self-reports, and the census, U.S. Census does that, of course, as well, in which you get a very inflated number, a number that uh, can't possibly be accounted for by birth rates across census measurement, actually. Um, and so depending on who, how you define this, you end up either with 5 million self-identified Indians on the census, or um, 3 million if you include only those who say that I'm just Indian and nothing else, or 2 million if you look at the service populations of the BIA and the IHS. So, so somewhere probably just over 2 million is probably what we're talking about if we're thinking about members of federally recognized tribes. Um, of course, this isn't just about then um, who you claim or what you claim to be, but also who claims you. So uh, we are wanting to think, I think, of Native identity as more than just self-identification. It's also about uh, recognition by uh, your own tribal community. And so it's really not an ethno-racial designator in the same way that um, other ethnic identities are in this country. It's a political status. And uh, again, uh, this group doesn't need that uh, background so much, but something I say in contextualizing this whole field. Um, we also have the context, of course, of tribal sovereignty. And with the federal trust obligation, uh, there is the obligation by the federal government to provide health services for American Indians as part of the treaty relationship and so on. And uh, that comes typically through the Indian Health Service and through contracts and compacts funding through the Indian Health Service. The, my point in recognizing this is that it creates a really distinctive service ecology for mental health services that it's important for us to take note of as we think about mental health issues. We, of course, suffer from American Indian mental health disparities. That is, as many of you already know, there are epidemic levels of distress in many of our communities. In particular, there are high levels of trauma and substance abuse problems, uh, violence uh, uh, and family uh, breakup and that sort of thing. Um, and indeed, the community mental health services that are on offer to assist us with these things are really underfunded. So you probably know that the Indian Health Service gets something like 40 cents on the dollar if you compare it to the kind of health plans that other federal um, employees get uh, courtesy of the government. So there is, remains a really large unmet need. Lots of problems, not very uh, adequately funded services. 
So what I want to do next then is to consider the case for integrating therapy. Um, when I say therapies, I have the broad sense of not just mental health interventions like psychotherapy and counseling, but also traditional healing. And we'll talk about that here in a bit. So if we have this large unmet need and these pronounced disparities, the, but the services are underfunded, it makes sense simply to fund the services and expand them, right? What we need are more mental health services throughout our communities. Except that it's not really quite so simple, is it? And one of the dilemmas here has to do with a couple of problems. First is what I call the problem of cultural difference. That is, American Indians uh, and uh, you know, the immigrants from Western Europe uh, and Eastern Europe later and so on are historically distinctive cultural enclaves. That is, there are persistent practices, uh, cultural practices that are different between our historical communities and the historical communities of Europe. And those are reflected both in what I'll call cosmology, or the level, sort of a um, sacred understanding of how the universe works, as well as in ethnopsychology. Now, just to try and add a little meat to the bones here, what do I mean by an example of cosmology? Um, you heard in the introduction that I'm Grovant. Grovants are from uh, part of like the Arapaho group. Uh, we're in Montana, the Arapahoes are in Wyoming and Oklahoma. But our understanding of the Supreme Being was someone, uh, and one of the names we have for the Supreme Being translates as he who controls all by the power of thought. So there's this notion that the Supreme Being, as a sort of the prime thinker, if you will, keeps the cosmos running by virtue of wish, desire, intentionality, and thought. That is, um, that the Supreme Being, because of being all-powerful, is able to simply think something and it is real in the sense of reality. Now that's a sense of cosmology and it underlies all aspects of personhood as it's distributed through the universe. Other beings, not just the supreme being, who have intentionality, who have desire, who have wish, can also have some impact through the power of their thinking. And this traces down into ethnopsychology as well, where human beings, as agents, as people with intents and wants and desires, can shape reality by the way we think. Grovance used to say that we could think people to death if we disliked them or had something against them in our community. And there's a whole range of domains in which if we trace out, people are very careful about not only what they say, but what they think, because they believe that thought has the power to shape, transform reality. So this is a sense in which I'm talking about these persistent cultural practices that are reflected in cosmology and in ethnopsychology that trace down through our tribal communities in ways that are pretty distinctive from the way uh, these sensibilities evolved in the West. And therefore, the culture of the mental health clinic, as it exists even in Indian Health Service and many of our reservations, is not the culture of the American Indian community, right? There's kind of a pretty distinctive segregation of many assumptions and beliefs and perspectives there, which leads to this problem of cultural difference. Now, you can imagine cultures that are quite different, cultures, groups of people who share different cultural traditions, coming together on equal footing and having a nice exchange and getting along well, and it's no big deal. You learn from each other. You learn to navigate each other's differences, what have you. But in this country, with the history we've had with European immigrants, we have also the problem of cultural dominance. So it's not as if we can meet on equal footing because we have this history of colonial domination in which one example, of course, was the, uh, the boarding schools that were set up by the federal government once uh, Indians had settled on reservations uh, to try and um, essentially kill the Indian and save the man, as the official slogan went. The idea, of course, was to assimilate savages into civilization by virtue of having uh, Indian people adopt uh, Euro-Western sensibilities, cultural practices, um, you know, lower status, class roles in society, and so on. And so because of this long history of domination, and the enduring power asymmetries that are with us still today, um, it's not the case that you can just exchange evenly with your regard to cultural difference. You've got this problem of cultural dominance lingering in the background as well that requires some kind of attention and redress. All of this leads to what I call the post-colonial predicament. Now, when we think of post-colonial, we might think of a state like, is, uh, like uh, India, in which the British settled there and basically you know, enslaved the people in all sorts of ways and uh, stole all kinds of resources that they needed for their empire. Um, and then the Indians rose up, Gandhi, you know the story, and kicked them out. The British went home, India declared itself uh, independence and now is an independent state. Um, in that sense, India is called post-colonial because there were colonizers there who were uh, raping and wrecking the land, and those people were sent packing. Uh, that's not the way things work in settler colonial societies like the United States and Canada and New Zealand and so on. No one's going to send home packing. 
So we end up in terms of talking about post-colonial status of requiring what I put in here is parentheses around the post. You know, it's not exactly clear what post looks like. On the one hand, since the 70s, we have self-determination in Indian country as a matter of federal policy. And tribal nations are able to do an awful lot, call their own shots in so many important ways. On the other hand, Congress always has plenary power and can always, with the stroke of a pen, terminate any tribe it wants. So this post business tries to capture the fact that, yeah, things look better for us now. We are calling the shots, but it, does, it is not guaranteed that it will remain that way. And so post-colonial is a funny designator to put here. But what I call the post-colonial predicament is essentially that on the one hand, we have very urgent community needs. We have these impoverished high-risk settings and these very documented disparities in mental health status. But on the other hand, we have incongruent clinical services. That is, the mental health services that are on offer through IHS or IHS-funded programs are typically not suited to what Indian people want or need in times of crisis. This is attested to by anecdote. I mean, all kinds of Indian people will complain about what's on offer in behavioral health. Many Indian people will never go to Indian behavioral health, um, IHS behavioral health, unless there's a court order or their kids are going to be taken away, some kind of coercive circumstances. And it's also been documented in research as well, where uh, surveys of health uh, attitudes and behaviors in Indian country have documented that many Native people who are going through a tough time would prefer to see traditional healers or use tr utilize traditional means for assistance or support rather than consider going to a mental health or behavioral health professional. Now the way this usually gets taken up in mental health circles is what we call cultural competence. And those of you who are outside of mental health will recognize cultural competence as well. It's sort of a, a, a a clarion call in the health field more generally, but it's cultural competence that's said to be professional psychology's remedy in particular when it comes to mental health services. Cultural competence was really designated as a reaction to so-called monocultural bias in the profession. That is that you know, mainly white professional practitioners were understood to occupy and embody and embrace mainly Western European cultural sensibilities and assumptions, and therefore um, cultural competence is what's required for them to be more effective in working with, quote, the culturally different. And it was desired, of course, to counter racist invalidations of vulnerable clients by practitioners who might have been well-meaning but just ignorant, saying the wrong things, doing the wrong things, making the wrong assumptions about their patients, and creating a lot of havoc. And of course, tailoring psychotherapy for the culturally diverse then became the call of the day with regard to this cultural competence. A little hard to see, I know. This is one of those tables that you might have come across. If you're in professional psychology, you almost certainly have come across a table like this, in which cultural competence is really construed as a, a mix of beliefs and knowledge and skills. And you can just kind of read for a second a handful of these. Uh, this is by um, Daryl Wing Sue and Patricia Arredondo, Patricia Arredondo, who uh, put this together and were able to mobilize it and get it institutionalized um, through a lot of resistance, actually, over the past 15 years or so. So certain beliefs, certain attitudes, certain skills are assumed to help clinicians or therapists or counselors become um, culturally competent and therefore able to be more effective in working with uh, Native people. You'll note, or perhaps you didn't, but I'll tell you, that there were a couple of things in there that talked about traditional healing explicitly. So attitude number eight talks about the respect for indigenous helping practices. Right, That's part of being culturally competent, according to this uh, rubric. Skill number seven can seek consultation with traditional healers. So the notion that practitioners should be able to you know, uh, get someone on the phone or go visit them or find someone as a traditional healer who could maybe assist with helping a patient or client in distress where things aren't working that well otherwise. In fact, cultural competence in and, and this particular framing really tries to see traditional healing in some ways as the quintessential form of culturally competent therapy. In other words, if you could package traditional healing for a particular community, people who advocate for cultural competence would tend to say, yeah, that would be the heart, the soul of cultural competence. That's how you would be the most culturally competent you can be, simply be a traditional healer. So the question then I think arises for our consideration here today about principles and approaches that might be harnessed from traditional healing for purposes of thinking about how to better serve uh, Native people, who many of whom are objecting to the usual behavioral health services, and what lessons can be drawn for professional psychology along these lines as well. Now, 
There have been efforts and attempts to integrate counseling and traditional healing for American Indians for quite some time now. There were very early collaborations between mental health professionals like psychiatrists, some psychologists, and traditional healers in Indian country through mental health services dating back uh, really to the 60s and 70s, at least in the published literature. It's probably happened even longer than that, but that's where it started showing up in the scientific literature with work by Carolyn Atney, for example, who would talk about psychiatrists working in the IHS who would partner with traditional healers to try to consult on cases together and figure out how to help particular Indian clients or patients. Uh, Mr. Thinout gave us the, uh, uh, the blessing this morning, and he and uh, Rick Thomas together developed this Red Road to Recovery during the 1970s, had a big influence on my family and my reservation. That is an explicit effort to wed a kind of substance abuse recovery tradition with uh, Lakota and other Native practices. Uh, there was this classic article in the journal of the Counseling Psychologist uh, by um, Teresa LaFromboise, Joseph Trimble, and Jerry Mohat in 1990 that really tried to work out what would it look like to integrate these things and that it was really important that we do that and can we get going on this project. Um, Eduardo Duran, uh, a Pueblo psychologist, uh, has talked about what I'll call soul wound psychotherapy. He's got a couple of different books out and goes around the country talking about a really pretty alternative way of thinking about how to do counseling and psychotherapy. It's overtly religious and spiritual. It very much depends on um, uh, you know, an integrative approach for its intelligibility. And of course, indigenous communities are ongoing sites of therapeutic integration. Um, there's even research that's attested to the development of sweat lodge ceremonies in substance abuse treatment throughout Indian country, which was something that started back in the 60s. Pretty much everywhere you go in Indian country now, you'll find traditional practices of one way, shape, or form put together at least with substance abuse, if not with other kinds of uh, conventional mental health treatment approaches. So I've talked to you about why it might be useful to think about integrating these things, but I also now want to think a bit about um, the complications that might arise in doing so. In fact, I want us to consider a brief comparative exercise, that is to think about the features of counseling uh, or professional psychotherapy um, on the one hand and then try and compare and contrast those a little bit with the features of some aspects of native traditional healing and see what we can learn about them with regard to that. So let's just start with professional counseling or psychotherapy, which is something that probably is a little more familiar to many health providers. So I won't go in exhaustive detail, but I'll just give you some highlights. Today in particular in um, health services, um, the delivery of psychotherapy or counseling is heavily shaped by market forces in the era of what I'll call evidence-based health care. You're probably all familiar with evidence-based health care. It's the idea that services on offer should be anchored or grounded in scientific data that show that they're effective in helping people. And if you don't have evidence or data from scientific studies to show that, we shouldn't be doing it. Let's do what is scientifically as opposed to what's not. And that's tied to market forces around cost cutting and trying to keep health care uh, reasonably uh, within budget and so on, so not trying to squander or waste dollars on practices that we don't know if they work or not. So that is a big context for professional counseling today. It typically, because it's evidence-based and, and dependent on scientific findings, involves what I'll call a standardization of approaches or techniques. One big problem with evidence-based healthcare is most clinicians, in, at least in mental health circles, don't do it. They're not trained to do it, and they don't do it. That's changing, of course, over time as a doctoral training uh, shifts to embrace that more. But there's legions of clinicians out there who already offer mental health services and were trained differently. And so if they don't do it, how do you get them to do it? You try to disseminate it, you try to train them, all this, but it's very, very difficult to get clinicians to take out approaches that they're not familiar with and maybe not that um, supportive of. So it's an effort to standardize clinical practice amidst a huge diversity that happens, at least for now. Efficacy, that is whether it's understood to work or not, is tied to technical mechanisms. That is uh, um, the reason why we think about an evidence-based treatment is because um, we think that there's a certain sequence of steps, a script that a clinician can follow that involves a certain set of techniques that unfold in a certain way that are meant to help people. So we think about you know, cognitive behavioral treatment for depression. And there's cognitive behavioral treatment has a logic, a rationale, it has a sequence of stages you're gonna go through with a, with a patient. And if as long as the patient participates in all that and does the homework assignments and all that sort of thing, there's a good chance they'll get better. Right? So technical mechanisms are what underlies just the fact that you follow the sequence and that there are steps and that you do the homework exercises and the activities are mapped out um, pretty nicely. In fact, there's manuals for evidence-based treatment. They can hand your clinician a manual and as long as they have the proper training, they can follow the script essentially while they do this. Therefore, therapists are understood to be roughly interchangeable. 
as long as you're a competent therapist who's been trained in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy for depression, shouldn't matter who you are. You should, as long as you have also em relevant empathic skills, um, you know, I can, uh, you might leave, I'll hire someone new. As long as they have that training, I can count on that being done, essentially. And therapist expertise in Prithia Den is, is, is comprised of a few things. It, it's grounded in research evidence, first and foremost. Is there science to support that the therapist doing this helps someone? Technical know-how, obviously you have to be trained in how to apply, follow the script in a way that is organic enough to meet the needs of the patient and have the requisite empathic skills and relational skills and so on, and involves client tailoring. Um, there, there is a sense in which you've got to meet the client where they're at, you've got to find a way to, to you know, uh, not only connect with them, but motivate them to follow through and engage in the actual script. But it's the script more than anything else that's important. We call that fidelity to technique. You adhere to the script, that's more important really than the client. To, it's not that you have to trade them off. Client tailoring is important too. But you can't diverge from the script so, um, to such a degree that it doesn't work anymore, then it's not evidence-based. So there's an understanding that the technique matters a lot. In sum then, what I'm saying is that the emphasis in evidence-based treatment um, as it's practiced in psychotherapy throughout mental health services is on the technical more so than the relational. It's about technique, it's about the script, it's about doing the scientific-based um, approaches. And yes, you need enough relationality to be able to be effective with a client, but you know that's not really what matters. The action is with the technique. So let's talk now about some features of American Indian healing traditions because I want to, as I said, try to um, juxtapose these for us a little bit. By the way, you should never give a professor the floor and tell him a time limit without having a clock somewhere. And it's dangerous work. So I have a, oh, my phone here, I'll take a look. Um, let's start with who is an American Indian healer. And audiences like this, I try to uh, sometimes ask a question of, if you think back over the 20th century, not the 19th century, but the 20th century, who would you nominate as you know, the most uh, famous? of Indian healers that might be known throughout Indian country and beyond. Um, and I get various responses. In interestingly, um, one of them, um, uh, Black Elk, who's very, you know, pretty famous around the world, I mean, because of a certain movement in the 1960s in particular, uh, it's surprising that a lot of the younger audiences don't come up with that. Maybe Black Elk's falling out of fashion or he's not taught anymore or something. So, but Black Elk, I think, is the obvious answer. The less obvious answer, one I like to play with a little bit, um, is Oral Roberts. The Reverend Oral Roberts, who was a you know tent uh, revivalist, who went around uh, doing faith healing. He has a whole philosophy about the seed of faith. If you give money, you know, God will reward you with riches, right? Um, and Oral Roberts was very, very proud of his Indian ancestry. Um, and as I said, it's not just what you claim; it's also who claims you. Oral Roberts was actually awarded the Indian of the Year by at the Anadarko Exposition in Oklahoma in 1960-something. So um, Oral Roberts is an interesting case. I mean, it complicates, I think, our assumptions about both what it is to be a healer and what it is to be an Indian healer. And of course, it raises the question, of course, who's, who's an Indian? I won't push that too, too far, but I just want to say that we do need to recognize that there are, of course, diverse traditions in healing in Indian country, and we don't want to pretend like, you know, there's not. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about uh, tent revivals so much. I want to focus more on Indian healing traditions from the Northern Plains for my example today. And I've written uh, quite a bit now about um, uh, a Grovant healer, a medicine man who was famous in the 19th century named Bull Lodge. My uh, great-grandfather actually um, wrote a lot about Bull Lodge in an effort to try and preserve some of our uh, cultural understandings back in the 1940s, and I've had opportunity to work with that material to think about mental health, psychotherapy, integration, and so on. Um, having done that, I'm not going to focus on that today. Since I'm in South Dakota, I thought I'd try my hand at, uh, at Hayaka Sapa, Black Elk, a little bit, um, and think about him as a case illustration along with another one for how um, we might think about healing. So. Um, you know, it's a little risky to come into South Dakota and talk about Black Elk and Lakota tradition. So I, 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 I'm open to hearing from some of you who know better about those things, the details when I'm done if I was wrong about anything. I'll try my best not to be. Um, Black Elk's interesting because, as you might recall, when he was a young boy, um, he was out hunting, shooting uh, birds with his uh, bow and arrow, and he had a vision. I think he was nine years old, and he saw clouds rolling in, and then he saw a man in the sky, and the man talked to him. And he insisted that he was fully awake, wasn't asleep or anything like that. And this kind of signaled the onset of a set of communications with uh, the beings above that endured throughout his, um, the, his adolescence. And in fact, uh, when he was an adolescent, um, he fell into a troubled, uh, he was sick, 
and he fell into a, a lapse into some kind of state of half consciousness uh, where he was in uh, bed in the lodge for um, well, more than a week anyway and had his grand vision um, and was communicated a lot of things and Black Elk was really known for his great vision of course. Um, but Black Elk um, was uh, a hilka. Uh, it was called uh, by the thunder, exactly. Um, and in fact, um, the thing I understand about hioka is, is that it can be a very uh, fearful experience for those who are called uh, to it in adolescence because you're essentially hunted by the thunder until you fess up to the fact that you've been selected and accept the role of a hioka in the community. And there's a lot of obligations and things that come with being a hioka. People don't necessarily want to do that. Um, and so they're ambivalent about it and, and, and uh, are fearful that the thunder is going to strike and they're going to get killed if they don't do it. And Black Elk suffered this way for a lot of years in his uh, teenage years as well. Um, until at last he came to uh, consult with a medicine person in, in his community and announced himself as a Hioka, went through the ceremony, and thereafter you know, filled that role for his community. Hiokas are typically healers as well. And Black Elk of course, was, of course, known for his healing. Um, he uh, lived at a time on the reservation, Pine Ridge, where there were Jesuits who were increasingly powerful and who were, of course, interested in bringing Christianity and in suppressing so-called pagan approaches and rituals. And so he had altercations with Jesuit priests who would walk into his ceremonies. Um, one of them walked in, uh, scattered his implements around, and told him this was the devil and they better quit. Um, I think Blackout was gratified when uh, a few weeks later this priest was bucked off a horse and killed because that, in some ways that reinforced the notion that if you disrupt these kinds of sacred things, bad things might happen to you or the members of your family. Um, but it wasn't too long, long later that another Jesuit broke in, uh, scattered his influence again, seized him by the throat, and announced, devil, get out. And for whatever reason, this shook Black Elk to his core, and he renounced his healing and his uh, vision and his activities and became a Catholic convert. And thereafter, the rest of his life, he was about 40 or so at that time, the rest of his life, he was a devout Catholic. Uh, in fact, went so far as to uh, circle around the reservations in South Dakota and the Midwest, uh, uh, preaching Catholicism, essentially, to convert people. Um, and so you have these very interesting ways in which lives unfold in the context of these kinds of colonial exchanges. Um, Black Elk, very famous healer at the time, Heoka, uh, but who renounced all of that um, to do something else. Um, but that's not to say that the um, healing traditions went away or that the Hyoka tradition went away. So I really like to talk about this book, Price of a Gift, by Joseph Eagle Elk and Jerry Mohat. Jerry Mohat is a psychologist um, who passed away here just a few years ago, but who did an awful lot of important good work in Indian country. He was trained to be a Jesuit actually on the Rosebud Reservation and decided that that wasn't his calling after all. Became a psychologist, was an influential in helping get Sinigaleshka set up back in the day. Um, just a wonderful man. And uh, so worked a lot with a lot of healers on Rosebud. And so this is why Joseph Eagle Elk in particular was willing to collaborate with Jerry to uh, talk about his life in this particular book. Joe Eagle Elk also was a Hioka. Just like Black Elk, he had visions starting at a very young age, was haunted and hunted by the thunder for a long period of ambivalence until accepting the role of Hioka, coming out of as that role in his community and taking on ceremonial obligations as a result. And so one thing I want to do in terms of our comparative exercise here is to try and um, draw out from this book one incident that Joseph Eagle Elk reports from his own healing practice that I think can be instructive for us. And it's in a little chapter in the middle of the book called The Fish and the Man. So uh, Joe Eagle Elk, as uh, Hioka's often do, practiced uh, the Uweepi, uh, was, it's a, um, the terms are not great in English. You consult spirits through ceremonial purposes for, for healing. Um, and uh, in this instance, he was uh, working with a psychologist in Oklahoma, I mean in Wyoming. Uh, the psychologist was a white guy, but the psychologist was treating a young man who had cancer. And as a result of this cancer diagnosis and struggling with his health, also was depressed. And I was thinking about whether life was worth living and so on. The psychologist friend talked to Joe Eagle Elk because he came over for sun dances and got to know Joe. And basically said, yeah, I'm not sure what to do. I mean, I don't know how to help him anymore. And Eagle Elk says, well, let me, let me take this case to my spirits and, and we'll see what they say. Uh, normally I don't do that for people who aren't here coming to me for things. But in this case, let me see what happens. So he uh, put on a ceremony and got word back from the spirits that this man indeed had cancer. That cancer grows like a flower, that uh, like a flower it can be stunted in its growth, that the spirits would halt the growth of the cancer, but that the man needed to do something more if the cancer was to go away. And what the spirits told Joseph Eagle out that the man needed to do was to go fishing. 
In fact, they had pretty specific instructions. He was to go fishing, he was to hook a fish on the line, bring the fish in, cup the fish in his hands, look it in the eye, wish it a long life, and then uh, tell it its problems. And he would say something to the fish, he, whatever would come from the heart in the moment, and the fish would say something back, only for the young man. And the young man would then conclude, conclude his uh, communication with the fish, release the fish into the pond, and who knows, maybe the fish would take something away with it, with the implication being that cancer might go away as a result. So this was the word the spirits gave the Joe Eagle out. Joe Eagle told the psychologist. The psychologist went back to Wyoming, consulted with the young man. They tried to go fishing because they were willing to follow through on this and see what would happen. Um, meanwhile, the cancer did stop growing. Uh, the doctors uh, released him. He was done with chemotherapy. He was improving. You know, he wasn't well exactly, but he was in better state than he had been. Um, and they tried to go fishing. And it seemed like uh, for many months, maybe close to a year, they couldn't actually make it to fish. Something would come up or something would break down or their plans wouldn't come together for various reasons. And in fact, Joe got to see, uh, Joe Eagle got to see uh, the psychologist again saying, you've got to go fishing, just do it, you know, make a, make a way. So finally, they go fishing together. Um, they go out to their favorite fishing hole and they're skunked, no fish will bite. Uh, so after a few hours of trying that, they go to another place and they're skunked. So finally they decide, well, we're going to go to the place where you pay to fish because you've got to catch fish there. So they pay, they go in where all the ponds are stocked and they can't get a fish. So, you know, they go to the guy who's uh, responsible, you know, owns the ponds and says, we just, we just can't get one and we really need help. And the guy said, well, here's where we grow them. <laughs> go fish in this tank and you will definitely get a fish. No questions asked. So uh, the young man goes, casts his line in and pulls a trout straight out. Now, I've heard this story both in terms of reading this book, but I've heard it from Jeff King, another native psychologist who knows this psychologist in Wyoming, so it's sort of, I guess, to me, third hand, he, uh, who witnessed this conversation. The man pulls the fish out, puts it in his hands as he's supposed to, and starts talking to the fish, low voice. Um, so the psychologist doesn't really know what he's saying, but presumably he's wishing it a long life and doing the things that he was instructed to do. And he kind of finishes up his prayer or whatever, and this fish makes a noise. And the noise, according to Jeff King, it's something like, mwah, mwah. Now, maybe it was a catfish. I don't know. It was kind of a weird sound. <laughs> but of course, that kind of startled this young man. I, I don't know if you've been fishing enough or ever heard fish do that, but I don't think it's all that common. Um, and, and the man was just elated that, you know, he had this fish hack actually talked to him. He put the fish back in the pond and let it go. And they were done fishing. So. All that he was able to do to follow through with regard to the consultation of the spirits that were passed along for Joe Eagle Up happened in this way. But of course, the young man didn't know what the fish had said. And as Joe Eagle Up reflects, looking back on this incident now, um, the young man died. And um, in part, the young man died. Joe Eagle Elk imagines trying to think through this might be because he never bothered to try and figure out what the fish was, had said. Eagle Elk claimed that, look, if he'd come back to a ceremony right thereafter, the spirits would have told him what the fish said, and maybe there would have been instructions or who knows what, but that's not what he did. He just went back to Wyoming and then got worse, deteriorated, and died. And Joseph Eagle Elk concludes the story by explaining that, uh, you know, they, they, they were kind of caught in between our ways and their ways. Uh, it, maybe they couldn't lend their whole mind to the Lakota practices and traditions the way they needed to. Otherwise, they would have come and done the ceremony and heard what the fish had said as interpreted by the spirits. Um, and so the story doesn't have a happy ending. The man wasn't uh, restored to wellness from his cancer, but you get a glimpse at least of the way in which a healing practice unfolds in this Lakota uh, sensibility, at least as Joseph Eagle Elk practiced it um, as a Heoka uh, using the Uwipi. Now, just like we talked about features of uh, uh, psychotherapy and counseling, let's talk a little bit about features of this particular episode of healing then. And I want to submit to you that this isn't totally unusual, that if you look around at least the northern plains that, where I've looked at, you know, these kinds of things are common. This would not be foreign to people in Montana or people in Wyoming or, you know, so. Um, and it probably is not all that foreign to people in other parts of Indian country as well. Um, so in terms of the features, well, curing rituals, first of all, they do adhere to kind of a broad cultural patterning, um, but they just remain also distinctive for each healer. So when you're a, a Heoka or, or any, you accept a healing role, you end up with spirit patrons or spirit sponsors who teach you to do certain kinds of things, and those are the things you're supposed to do, and no one else does it maybe exactly that way. But they're going to have common elements. So Bull Lodge, the Grovant medicine I told you about, 
what he cured, he had a bowl, a cloth, a drum, um, and he did certain things with these implements. And similarly, black elk had a bowl and a drum, and you know, so the, the, a whistle. So there's things in which you know there are common elements that um, are part of what comes together in any given healing ritual. But the ritual itself might be distinctive to the given healer. These healers' ritual protocols are standardized. That is, they're supposed to be done a certain way every time, mostly because that's how you get the spirits to attend to you. That's how um, you get uh, the consultation you need. Um, but the treatments that result are not standardized. So you would never conclude from the fish and the man that, oh, yeah, there's a fish-talking way to get rid of cancer. No one would claim, not Joseph Eagle Elk, not Jerry Mohat, no one's going to claim that, oh, yeah, if you hold a fish and talk to it, it'll talk back, and that's how you could get rid of cancer. That's the, the cure for cancer. Because that part is totally distinctive. The spirits gave, uh, you know, essentially a diagnosis and a treatment plan based on this particular individual, and that might never happen again in your healing practice the rest of your days. That was a one-time thing for that particular individual. And so, whereas, you know, the consultation process, the ceremonies and the rituals are used to consult your spirits um, are standardized, the treatments that result are not. Curing rituals involve both humans, but as well as, we'll say, other than humans. The reason I don't say spirits is because, you know, spirits, spirit and material have a long dichotomous history in Western thought. It's hard to, to reproduce that in ways that do justice to Indian country, so I'll say other than humans. In the exercise of what I'll call will power, will slash power, as I put it here. This has to do back to that idea I mentioned earlier, the cosmology around the ability of desire and wish and thought to change and create reality. So the sense in which the exercise of will in that way is powerful and it can affect reality. And so there's a sense in which what happens in these kinds of rituals are that people come together, humans and other than humans, they're all people, and they exercise this will power in a unified, concentrated way, the exercising of thought. This is why in ceremony, you're all supposed to be of the same mind. You're supposed to con concentrate your thoughts on what, what is supposed to happen as a result of it. And um, together, that can have efficacy in changing uh, reality. Therefore, efficacy depends on the willpower of all those involved, not just the technical mechanisms. Okay, it's not about you know following this script, doing this set of circumstances, or following these kinds of techniques. And healers and their other than human helpers are not interchangeable, but rather they're in some ways they're the single most important therapeutic variable, if you will. This healer has this reputation or has these gifts to do that. And of course, as you know, in our communities, one family's healer is another family's charlatan. These things are contested, they're controversial, you know, so you go to the healer that your grandma says go to or whatever, and you don't go to the one she says don't, right? So there's ways in which the healer is actually much more important than, um, you know, the particular ritual as an abstraction. Competent ritual management is associated, um, uh, of associated in personal interactions is really crucial for beneficial outcomes. Part of the healer's job is to get everyone in there together on the same sheet of music, in the same frame of mind, all concentrating on the one thing at hand. And this is why you don't want to, quote, bring negativity into a ritual. This is why you don't want to be distracted in your thinking, because ceremonial conditions are such that if you are harboring resentment, animosity, bitterness, they can amplify that stuff and someone can get hurt, right? So there's a sense, again, in which um, managing the interpersonal uh, aspects of ceremony or ritual are a big part of what a healer does. Violations of ritual protocol, whether intentional or not, and, of course, participant maleficent, someone who is thinking badly towards someone, really can be dangerous for patients. This is one thing that's lost in the New Age version of our spirituality. Everything's happy, everything's helpful, everything's holy. Not so in our traditional ways. Uh, traditionally, we understood that these things could be harmful if they're not observed properly. We also understood and knew that people could use them for bad things, right? That you could have gifts and powers that you might exercise out of jealousy or envy and hurt people. So there's a sense in which um, you know, part of the management is about those sorts of things as well. And, and as a consequence, fear is an intelligible response to ceremony and ritual. Because you don't know, you, you, there's a lot of things going on that can be dangerous and that you're not in control of. And um, so, you know, there's, you're trusting an awful lot of people uh, to do things on your behalf in, in ways that obviously you can't directly influence. The sum total of all this is to say I think that there's really an emphasis on at least this kind of traditional healing practice on the relational over the technical. 
It's about the people, both human and other than humans. It's about the nature of the relationship between the healer and the other than human patron or sponsor. It's about all the people coming together and exercising unity of thought, concentration of will on behalf of a patient. It's heavily interpersonal, depends a lot on the people that are involved. It's relational way more than it is technical. So I think we have some divergence in these traditions here. I said that psychotherapy and counseling is technical more than relational, the interchangeable clinician who follows the script, the script's the same, the people can be different. Whereas for Indian healing, the people matter and the people and their relationships matter more so than any particular script they might follow. And um, it has really important implications, I think, for this notion of evidence-based treatment and the notion of generality or generalizability of particular kinds of interventions. So Vine Deloria uh, in 2001 wrote, the key to understanding Indian knowledge of the world is to remember that the emphasis was on the particular, not on general laws and explanations of how things work. The particular. So this is the fish and the man, right? So I want to call our attention to some big words here, but um, they're important to, and as we think about things like evidence-based treatment, the nomothetic ideographic distinction. Nomothetic ideographic. Nomothetic refers to that which is general. So it's knowledge that's general that apply, can apply to everybody. It's the idea that we have a treatment, we've scientifically tested it, we know that it can help you, 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 and you in all likelihood if we do it in a certain way according to the technique. And it's generally, it's probabilistic, it's statistical. You know, it may not help you, it might help only four out of the five of you because we can't predict exactly if it will help every single individual. It's only going to help most of you. And we don't know which of you counts as most and which will be the exception. So it's probabilistic in how it's applied. Whereas ideographic refers to that which is totally distinctive to a given case, applicable only to a unique individual. This is sort of like the fish and the man, this young man with the cancer who has to talk to the fish. There's no one else that is going to be doing any fish talking necessarily in, in Joe Eagle's uh, healing uh, practice. Uh, it's ideographic. It's unique and distinctive to that one person. And so what we want to do, I think, is just keep in mind that you know, evidence-based psychotherapy or evidence-based treatment really is nomothetic. It's the idea that we can learn the underlying techniques and these can be applied in general to everybody with some expectation that a large number of them, although which ones will and which ones won't, we don't know, will benefit. Whereas the ideographic commitments are there, I think, in some aspects of American Indian healing practices. So I think this leads us to some interesting and thorny questions. I said I was going to try to set up some uh, dilemmas, some challenges for us. We think about trying to integrate traditional practices and counseling or therapy techniques. What are the implications of scientific evaluation for spiritual practices, especially within indigenous communities where our spirituality was deliberately suppressed by colonizing outsiders who thought our way of life was savage? How can we reconcile scientific evaluation with local knowledge traditions? Science comes out of the West, and there are knowledge traditions in Indian country that are not that. Um, and um, one of the things I grapple with in my own work my writing and my research is, you know, what are those traditions? How do they differ? How are they similar? And how do you put them together? And can you put them together? Can there even be evidence-based forms of American Indian um, traditional knowledge and practice? Well, there are lots of examples. I've talked about just a couple of ways in which these traditions diverge between Indian healing and counseling psychotherapy as practiced in healthcare. Um, here are some others. Necessity of ritual supplication for Indian healing to work. That's not something that works in, in counseling and therapy very much. The relevance of super, what I'll we'll call supernatural. It's another Western term that you use it because we don't have a common language uh, to do that outside of that in terms of the willpower. The regard for personal fortitude and vitality. Um, this was obviously so important when you live on the plains where the, even the winters can take a lot of people out and where you know you depend on hunting to make it and uh, so on. And so uh, you know that has implications for whether someone is in a place to even think of themselves as vulnerable or as in need of help and the ways in which psychotherapy is premised on notions of, of um, you know, coming to an expert for help with your personal problems. Um, this it works against, in some ways, this notion of fortitude and vitality. Construals of space and place. I talked about the interchangeable therapist. Anyone should be able to do it if they're trained properly. There's also the notion of the interchangeable clinic. Clinics could be here or, you know, doctors without borders. It could be in France and you transport a clinician to do the same thing over there. Whereas 